Hello, thank you for joining me today. Today we are continuing to follow along with the Explore the Bible curriculum as we study the book of Isaiah. The title of today's lesson is God Renews. It comes from Isaiah chapter 40 verse 18 through 31. The main point of the lesson is this, God provides strength for those who trust in Him. The book of Isaiah is considered by many scholars as the Bible in miniature. The Bible has 66 books and Isaiah has 66 chapters. The Bible is divided into two major thematic parts in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Isaiah can be divided into two thematic parts from chapter 1 through 39 to chapter and chapter 40 through 66. There are 39 books in the first part of the Bible and there are 39 chapters in the first part of Isaiah. There are 27 books in the second part of the Bible and there are 27 chapters in the second part of Isaiah. And there are many other similarities between the Bible as a whole and the book of Isaiah. And those comparisons could be a very lengthy study by themselves. But that discussion will have to wait for another time. At this point, in our study of the book of Isaiah, we begin looking at the second section, which corresponds to the New Testament. In these verses, we will see themes and prophecies about a promised Messiah and the end time events. In the context of today's verses, however, we will learn how God plans to provide strength and renewal for those who trust in Him. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you and we praise you for the opportunity to study your word again today. As we look at these passages today, cause our hearts to be encouraged as we see you encourage the Jews returning from exile. Give us the strength that we need to live our lives for you, to please you in all that we do, in all that we say, and in the attitude of our hearts. I pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Read with me Isaiah chapter 40, verse 18 through 31. With whom then will you compare God? To what image will you liken Him? As for an idol, a metal worker casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold, and fashions silver chains for it. A person too poor to present such an offering selects wood that will not rot. They look for a skilled worker to set up an idol that will not topple. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground, than He blows on them, and they wither, and a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. To whom will you compare me, or who is my equal? says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, my cause is disregarded by my God? Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. The first thing we see from these verses is the living God. Look at verse 18 through 20 again. 
With whom then will you compare God? To what image will you liken him? As for an idol, a metal worker casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and fashions silver chains for it. A person too poor to present such an offering selects wood that will not rot. They look for a skilled worker to set up an idol that will not topple. Now, in the verses preceding the ones we just read, we see many truths about the character of God. Now, I encourage you to read verse 10 through 14 for yourself. They speak about God as a sovereign power. They speak about God caring for His people as a shepherd cares for His sheep. They speak about God as the awesome creator of the universe. And they speak about God as the all-knowing and not needing counsel from anyone else. These verses lead to the questions that are found in verse 18. Is there anything that we can truly compare to God? The short and obvious answer is no. There is nothing and no one like our God. Unlike us, He needs no instruction and He knows all things. God has always been and He will always be complete in His knowledge and His understanding. Because He is the all-knowing, all-powerful, and always-present God of the universe, He alone should be served and worshipped. Exodus 20 verse 3 says, You shall have no other gods before Me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I... The Lord your God am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. The idols of the nations are no comparison to God. Since an idol is nothing more than a human creation, it has no power and it cannot even stand on its own. Verse 19 and 20 describe how idols are only inanimate ob material objects that are fashioned by human hands. Isaiah highlights the absurdity of going to, to so much trouble to worship what is ultimately worthless wood and stone. Idols can be made to look very impressive and fashioned very exquisitely. But in the end, they are just wood, stone, clay, or metal. To treat God as just another God or to compare Him to idols is blasphemous and dishonoring to His name, to His character, His work, and His attributes. Isaiah's goal was to show us that false gods are based on delusion. He wants us to realize that absolutely nothing compares to the glorious God of Israel. When we truly focus and acknowledge the greatness of God, we can begin to see everything else in its proper perspective. The next thing we see is the sovereign creator. Look at verse 21 through 26. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground than He blows on them and they wither. And a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Isaiah's listeners should have already known the fundamental truth that God is the Creator and that nothing compares to Him. 
But the questions in verses 18 and 21 reveal their unwillingness to listen to God's Word. The evidence of God's creating power was all around them in the heavens and on the earth. But they also repeatedly heard the prophets testifying of God's greatness, and they still failed to acknowledge God. Isaiah also emphasized that God is not only greater than the false gods of the nations, but He sits enthroned above the earth. He rules over every nation and individual. Compared to God, we are tiny and powerless. We are like a two-inch grasshopper. But God is so great that the entire universe could act as His canopy or His tent. Now, this is not meant to be an actual description of His physical size, but a metaphor describing the greatness of His being. Even the greatest rulers of men are under the rule of Almighty God. Mankind's greatest rulers are powerless and temporary when compared to God. Isaiah describes them as being planted, which indicates that they do not establish themselves by their own power. Their power and authority are granted to them by God alone. Romans 13.1 says, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. While the universe and all of creation may give us a glimpse of God's glory, they are not God Himself. God's creation only reflects His glory. God brought all of creation into existence, and He is the one that keeps it existing. And because of that, He alone is worthy of worship and praise. Now, lastly, we see that God is our tireless source of hope and strength. Look at verse 27. Why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? My cause is disregarded by my God? Don't, do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and His understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Instead of praising God and thanking Him for His deliverance, the Jews were complaining that God was ignoring them. Much like a patient parent, God will dismiss a single complaint. But these people, they were complaining nonstop that God had no concern for their problems. But stop and think about that for a minute. Think about the situation. They were complaining to the very God who had sent multiple prophets, He had given them His Word, He had dwelt among them, and He had saved them on many occasions and in many different situations. God was not ignoring them. In fact, He was blessing them. Sometimes we need to follow the military rule. Maybe you've heard it. Obey before you complain. Or another way to say it is, obey the first order that you received before you ask for a second one. God knows how we feel and how we fear, and He is more than able to meet every need. We can never obey God in our own strength successfully, but we can always trust Him to provide the strength that we need. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. Now, in verse 29 and 30, we have the promise of strength and power. When we are young, we often think that we are invincible and that we can do anything that we want. But the older we get, the more we learn 
that our human strength is fleeting. Verse 30 said, Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But God promises strength to the weary and increased power to the weak if we will put our hope in Him. Verse 31 tells us that those who patiently trust in the Lord and look to Him for strength will not be disappointed. The word translated hope indicates an active waiting, a waiting in anticipation. That means that we are not supposed to be just sitting around doing nothing. It means that we need to be actively meditating on His Word, praying diligently, and seeking to bring Him glory by how we live. Anytime we have hope for the future, it provides strength for the present. The words soar, run, walk in verse 31 indicate a forward movement. As we wait for God to work in our lives, He will enable us to soar in the midst of crisis, to run in the mire of challenges, and to walk faithfully with Him in the daily demands of our lives. I'm reminded of the lyrics to a song by John Waller. I will move ahead bold and confident, taking every step in obedience. While I'm waiting, I will serve you. While I'm waiting, I will worship. While I'm waiting, I will not faint. I'll be running the race even while I wait. Now you may have heard this next quote before. The journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. God wanted the Jews to step out in faith and to follow Him. And He wants us to do the same. But remember, the journey might not always be easy. So here's another good quote to encourage you from a famous Bible scholar. The greatest heroes of faith are not always those who seem to be soaring. Often it is they who are patiently plodding. Now, put your faith and your trust in the Lord. Wait on Him. He will help you fly higher, run faster, and walk longer. Thank you for being with me today to study God's Word. I pray that your faith and your walk with God grows stronger every day as you continue to trust in Him. May God bless you this week.